Merci pour l'invitation and thank you for the very relaxed ambience to, uh, to the organizers. And um, right, so I'll talk about formal conjugacy growth and um, I'll dive right in. I think everybody has run into growth of groups. We actually have seen quite a bit about it um, in the last hour. Um, so I'm not going to, um, to look at, I'm not going to count elements in a Kelly graph, but I'm going to count conjugacy classes. And I'll tell you exactly how I do that. Um, and well, um, I have a finitely generated group G. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, count the number of conjugacy classes of length N. And I'm going to call that sigma of N. And then I'm going to form um, a formal power series where the coefficients are exactly these numbers of conjugacy classes for every n. So I call this a sigma tilde to remind us of conjugacy. And, um, well, let's see. Um, I'm going to, um, to define in, in just a few seconds what um, the conjugacy length of an element or of a conjugacy class is. Um, so if you uh, don't mind waiting for a minute. Now, the, um, the, the thing that started this, uh, this work and uh, a few years ago was um, a conjecture of Riven. And um, in a preprint from 99 called um, <coughs> Growth, um, what was it? Um, growth of free groups and other stories that was on the archive for a long time before it got published in 2010. Um, Riven, at the end of this preprint, said, um, Well, I think that if, if we have a, a word hyperbolic group G, then this conjugacy growth series uh, should be transcend, well, should be non rational unless the group is virtually cyclic and, and very easy. So, uh, this is what I want to talk about today. Um, I will spend a bit of time talking about uh, one direction, which is that if indeed if the group is non-elementary hyperbolic, so not virtually cyclic, um, the growth series, this conjugacy growth series, is transcendental. And um, last year we proved, um, right, so I should say that most of the work that I'll talk about is with Iago Antolin from Vanderbilt. And um, if not, then I'll mention the name of the co-authors at the right time. So uh, last year I proved with um, Susan Hermiller, there I hold Sarah Reese, that indeed for the nicest, easiest hyperbolic groups, the virtually cyclic ones, uh, this uh, conjugacy growth series is indeed rational. And um, I'm not sure where one does this at university, but um, I thought before I talk too much is if we have a series, right? So we have, in my case, I'm counting discrete objects. So of course, this is going to be a, a natural number. Um, so if we have such a series, let's call it f of z, I think, I don't need to say it, but uh, um, because it is very intuitive, but we say that f of z is rational, right, if it, it is the, the quotient of two polynomials with coefficients in the integers or the rationals, it doesn't quite matter. And it is algebraic, again, think of rational numbers, algebraic numbers, if there exists some polynomial in two variables, x and y, such that uh, p of x and say f of x is equal to zero. So it's the root of some algebraic equation and transcendental otherwise. We all have maybe a favorite transcendental number. We have the same idea for, um, for functions. So transcendental. All right. So, um, so the uh, Riven conjecture is, is even stronger than uh, the one he uh, predicted. So not only the conjugacy growth is not rational, it's not even algebraic. So that means it's transcendental. And the results hold for all symmetric generating sets. One could even drop the symmetric, but it's not worth the pain of writing the details. So um, we'll leave it at that. All right. So. Um, I said um, I should define uh, what the conjugacy length of a, of a um, conjugacy 
class is. So this is how I think many people denote uh, conjugacy class of an element G. And uh, well, this, this might be an infinite set. Of course, we're in infinite groups. And in there somewhere, there will be an element of shortest length, right? So we look at the element of that element of shortest length in there, and that's the conjugacy length of G or of the conjugacy class. It doesn't quite matter with respect to the generating set that we're looking at. Um, and so when I count conjugacy classes, I'm looking, I'm counting exactly these number of smallest elements with respect to conjugacy um, that have length n. So that's the sigma of n. And I'll, I'll start dropping the, the x because, where is my pointer? Here. It's a bit, okay, there. And, um, well, how do you count such a thing? How do you find sigma of n, right? How do you determine the, the conjugacy growth? Um, well, I think a natural first thing to, to, uh, to do is to look at the words, right, that, that you should be counting. In other words, uh, look at the set of minimal length conjugacy representatives, right? So from each conjugacy class, take some word like that of smallest length uh, n. And, uh, a bit more formally, I, I wrote that uh, what you should look at is some word W that represents an element in a conjugacy class. Actually, this was G, so I should have put it there. But so pi of W is the usual projection. Um, and the word of this uh, W should be um, as small as possible, right, uh, with respect to um, conjugacy. And whenever I have such a word that's the smallest in a conjugacy class, I call it a conjugacy geodesic. Okay, so this is a conjugacy geodesic. Because we cannot shorten it if we take conjugates. All right, and so as a warm up, I said that we have both directions of the conjecture, but I decided not to prove the virtually cyclic part just to warm up with an example or two. So um, everybody's done this, I think, at some point. If you look at the easiest hyperbolic group Z, okay, we're not talking about finite groups here, so, um, well, any abelian group, in fact, conjugacy is the same as counting conjugacy classes, the same as counting elements, right? So I don't need to do anything in an abelian group. And so the conjugacy growth series exactly is the standard growth series, and we all know it. And it is, of course, rational. And if you think for a moment, what do conjugates look like in a, in a dihedral group or in, in a free product of two cyclics like that? Well, you see that that's very easy to determine. Things like A, B are conjugate to B, so you should only count one of them, right? Okay, so this was the, um, the, the beginning and um, for, for hyperbolic groups, what would be the next uh, group would be a free group, right? And how, how would we count things there? Well, what are the conjugacy representatives? You can have, you, you have choices. You can choose this smallest element or that one, but if you want to do it uniformly, an option is to look at the shortest um, word from the, with the lexicographic and lexicographic order, right? So, um, so what, what should you take as conjugacy representatives? What are short such sort of element? Of course, any power of A or B. And if I say that A is smaller than B, smaller than inverse and B inverse, if you take A, B, it seems reasonable, but you should not take B, A, because that's a larger word lexicographically. Um, and then you keep on going. If you take A, B inverse, you shouldn't take B inverse A and so on, because we know what conjugacy looks like in free groups. Okay, so you have this set where you put elements in there, and if you see a cyclic permutation, you don't, right? Because it's, you've already counted the conjugacy class. So it looks very uh, nice and easy, but turns out that the actual counting is not so nice and easy. Um, or it's, it's supply, well, now the, 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 the still the, um, uh, the first step in counting would be what? Well, what are shortest, uh, what are conjugacy geodesics in free groups? What are the smallest um, words with respect to conjugacy? Of course, the cyclic reduced ones, right? So, and then when are they conjugate? Well, of course, if there's cyclic permutations, which I already said, how many cyclic permutations do you have of this guy? You have four of them. It's the length of the word. So, BCA squared and 
two more, right? So if you want to count uh, conjugacy classes of length exactly n, you should take the cyclically reduced words of length n. People have computed that in a few papers, you, you see it there. Um, it's not as trivial as you might think, when it's, so it's not reduced words, but cyclically reduced. And then, well, they're all conjugate, so you, sh you only want to pick one of them. And so you should divide, in this case, by four. And in general, divide by n. And this is what Cornard did in a, in a paper from 2005. He looked at the free group, um, Fk. Um, he has the formula that you see above for cyclic reduced words, and he divided by n. And so, uh, well, you all know how many words of, of uh, length um, n one has in a free group, so reduced words. And you see that, okay, what we get is actually that the conjugacy, uh, I'm not done yet with the slides, so I know you might protest about some things, but um, just a second, right? So you see the, the asymptotics. It's 2k minus 1, n plus 1. So you see that it's essentially the same thing as the sphere, right? Or the number of reduced words um, in a free group divided by n. Um, so, although, of course, the symptoms are slightly different than, than that, but uh, anyway, that, that's the, the idea. And what, what is uh, incomplete about what I said? Well, the fact that there's a little p there, right? p stands for primitive, which have many different definitions and meanings. In this case, it means non-powers. Okay, so what he computed was the asymptotics of primitive elements, so meaning non-powers, not things that belong to bases, okay? Um, and in this case, you can't really do that, and it's not a problem, but in general, you can't, right? Because if you have powers, you have things like, uh, well, A, B, A, B, and of course, when you do cyclic permutations, you, you don't get four, you get two, so you should really divide by two in this case. And it turns out that this kind of division uh, by the right thing at the right time to, to find the exact number of conjugacy classes is, makes things tricky. And um, I cannot give you an exact formula for a sigma of n like that, you know, really precise formula, but uh, Riven computed for us the conjugacy growth series. And if you want to get a formula from there, good luck, I have no idea. So, um, so this, um, this is the conjugacy series, sigma tilde. It's the integral of h of t over t, and h of t is this, um, um, function, and I put the D in red to see that um, you have infinitely many poles. So this is very far from being rational, right? And, and it, it looks very difficult, in fact. So this is, again, this is kind of what motivated me to look at this, because I thought for free groups things shouldn't be hard, but it turns out, um, well, they, they kind of are in terms of counting. And I can say a lot more um, about where the difficulty comes. This was surprising, I think, maybe for group theory, but then I've seen there's lots of uh, analytic combinatorics papers that deal with this operation of taking a language and then just picking one element out of each permuta cyclic permutation class. So this has been done many times already in analytic combinatorics, and it's very well understood. Okay, and then, well, so as I said, this was a while ago. I, I saw the paper, I thought it's, it's very interesting, and then um, Susan Hermiller and I decided to look at the next easiest group, and that would be after free group, and that would be the free product of finite groups. And we noticed uh, essentially the same behavior as Riven, that unless you have the dihedral group, which you saw a few slides ago, where everything is nice and easy, um, we computed the, the um, conjugacy growth series, and, and it's far from rational. It's, again, an, an integral like you saw before. Okay, so this is the, the warm-up. And, um, and this is what made uh, Riven um, make this conjecture. He saw what happens for the free group, and he wondered, what about hyperbolic groups? And so I want to, um, um, to talk about, uh, about the proof of this, um, and um, as I said with Iago, and what I've been mentioning up to now was sigma of n. Sigma sort of stands for sphere, if you forget. Uh, but most of the time we don't work with spheres, we work with balls, so if you see phi of n, uh, that's all the conjugacy class of length up to n. That's a bit more natural. Turns out when we look at asymptotics, it doesn't matter which one you do, so 
that's not a problem. Um, so it turns out we did not have to do that much. Uh, a lot was done uh, by Kornar and Knieper. And so where does the result come from? Where we, we need two pieces. One is good bounds for conjugacy growth in hyperbolic groups, and uh, the next one you'll see uh, below. So let me um, take a couple of moments here to say what is happening. Um, so if you have a hyperbolic group, the conjugacy growth function is bounded by, um, well, I put e to the h, but is something, oh, okay. Um, let's just say <laughs> e to the h is lambda. And so what is happening essentially is that uh, you have uh, the conjugacy comes from, uh, is between some lambda to the n over n and some other constant lambda to the n. Um, over n. And, um, and la where lambda to the n is, is essentially right, so h is the, the growth rate of the group, so it's, um, <coughs> it's, it's what you've seen maybe Tuesday, I think, where you take the log of the size of balls and so on. All right, so this is uh, really the key part of the proof, and um, I'll tell you what was already done. And now the second part of the proof, and this is uh, um, something I find extremely beautiful, is, is a result of Flajolet from, what is this, analytic combinatorics. What he does is he looks at algebraic, uh, right, so algebraic growth series, and he understands the asymptotics of, of um, so if he knows he has one algebraic growth function, he expands it, he looks at the asymptotics of the, of the coefficients, the an, and he understands what they are. And it turns out that if you have a series where an is, is, is between these two uh, types of bounds, then the series cannot be algebraic. Okay, so this is really uh, a, a very nice trick from algebraic, uh, sorry, analytic combinatorics. So putting these two together, you see why we get that the series is transcendental. Um, now, a little bit about um, the Cornell and Knieper results. So what, what, um, what did they do? They proved the lower bound and the upper bound separately, but they're only looking, again, at primitive conjugacy classes, so those that are not powers, because, well, the motivation came from geometry, and there, if, well, conjugacy growth is motivated by counting closed geodesics up to homotopy on, on manifolds, and when you take via quasi-isometry, you get good asymptotics for, for the conjugacy classes. So, right, so if you have a closed uh, loop, you don't want to go on and on and on around it, you, so that would be a power, you just go once, and that's why you're interested in primitives. So they really did not bother at all with all conjugacy classes, they did not care. And so they have in one paper uh, this bound, this, this pointer is very drunk, I never find it. So, um, right, so the, the lower bound for primitive is, is this, and this is quite a difficult paper, it relies on um, a lot of sort of dynamical arguments. And, uh, well, you see that clearly we don't need to do any more work here because primitive elements uh, are sure fewer than all elements, and so we get the lower bound for free. There's nothing to do. And the second result that they have is, again, primitives, and they have the upper bound uh, as, as you want it, but this time, again, it's for primitives, and for some reason, uh, they only looked at torsion-free free groups, and so we had to generalize it and, and, um, and complete the picture, and this is what we had to do was, well, count all the conjugacy classes, not just the primitive ones, and remove the, uh, the torsion-free uh, part. And this is not, I mean, it takes a few pages, but I, everybody with would, would, uh, sort of tools in hyperbolic groups can do it, and you use the fact that in hyperbolic groups torsion is, is, is bounded, and then you count um, the number of cyclic permutations of a conjugacy representative, and yeah, I don't really, so that, that's, um, that's for the torsion, and then, um, and then when you look at non-primitive conjugacy classes, well, you know uh, that you have the feeling, right, that they should be negligible. That, right, so powers in a free group, you know they're negligible. The same thing happens in hyperbolic groups, although we did not find this in the literature, uh, and we couldn't find quite that the primitive, um, that, that 
powers are negligible, we just prove that conjugacy classes of primitives are negligible. It should be possible and done, but uh, yeah, we, we didn't need it, so we sort of stopped. So we, this was sufficient for the proof. Okay, so if you have hyperbolic groups, what do you do? You look to the next, you look at the next class. And what about relatively hyperbolic groups? And you don't need to know what they are. They're just a much bigger class of groups, right? Um, and uh, what I didn't say, um, when, I, when I showed you these kind of bounds, is that what you need first is really good bounds for standard growth. If you don't have that, you can't quite move to conjugacy growth directly, or maybe you can, but with a different approach. So it turns out that what you need, so what, uh, what Cornell and Knieper used was an older paper from 93 of Cornell where, he, where she shows that the, the ball of size n in a um, hyperbolic group is between, let's say, some C0 lambda to dn and C1 lambda to dn. Okay, so Cornell. Um, again, it's, a, it's an involved proof. If you haven't seen this before, you might think, what's the, what's the big deal? But it turns out that there are groups where you cannot get these nice kind of, uh, nice kind of bounds. I can give you examples later if you want, because like, the upper bound would be something like, I don't know, n plus 2. And so you cannot get this on the nose. And um, so this is a really important result. And, and uh, the, the two of them use this result um, and, and show what kind of what I showed you for free groups that you have to divide by n. Okay, and this, of course, much more complicated. The, the lower bound for them is really quite difficult, but that's the same idea. So if we want to do relatively hyperbolic groups, we should understand first growth. And uh, I was talking to, to, uh, to one of the speakers from Tuesday. So we, we have that for relatively hyperbolic groups. Um, and what we need to do then is, well, use so the same kind of behavior for relative hyperbolic groups and then go to conjugacy. And there I'm pretty certain that the techniques of Cornell and Knieper should work, uh, but it would take a lot of effort and so we postponed it at the moment and we moved on to yet the next class where um, it's not so clear that these bounds work. So, um, right, so next class again, you don't need to know what it is. I'll give you some examples, and I think next hour we'll hear all about them. I think, I don't know, Dennis is there, so, yeah. Um, so, can we have the same result for, um, for this class of groups? And, well, um, it's very unclear if these bounds hold. I mean, there are experts in the room. I'm not sure that, that this holds even for standard growth and then to move on to conjugacy growth. Um, I, I really have no idea. So then we thought, well, let's do the, the next best thing. If we cannot get the conjugacy growth series, at least look at the representatives that I need to count. Okay? So what does it mean? Look at conjugacy representatives, so pick one word, smaller, shortest word out of each conjugacy class. And um, so before I do that, as I said, I'm not going to give a definition in the hyperbolic groups, but people in this room are very influential in, in uh, defining them, developing theory, equivalence of definitions, coming up with examples. Um, so um, you, you see lots, I, I, I think um, I won't uh, go through, through each line. Um, so, right, so they're a very large class of groups, and we, uh, we decided to, to use the definition that I'm not going to tell you, but um, to, to say something about the conjugacy representatives. And what does it mean to say something about conjugacy representatives? Well, there are a bunch of words, and if you have a, s a set of words, that's a language, right? And so uh, it means classifying the language in, in some sense. And um, again, uh, you already are scared from the EDTOL talks. Uh, with languages, this is much milder. So, uh, so what is a language? It's just a set of words, L um, over some alphabet X. And uh, Chomsky in the 60s tried to understand human spoken languages via grammars, a simple mechanism that should generate uh, languages. He wasn't so successful, but his classification of languages was really influential in computer science. And so he came up with, uh, well, the colored sets that you see regular, context-free, context-sensitive, and recursively enumerable. 
And again, this would be a whole semester of formal language theory, so I don't really want to get into it. Let's just say the regular ones are the really nice, easy ones where algorithms work really well, uh, very quick, and maybe I should just uh, very quickly, right? So if you're regular, it means you have a graph with labels and you read words. Uh, you have to start somewhere, and uh, I don't know, I'm just going to do something very quick. Um, so you start at a certain vertex in your graph and you read all the words between that vertex and some allowed endpoint. And you look at the words, something like A, B squared A is in this language, write all the, all the words uh, that you can read off the graph and you get the regular language. Now today, um, I also added this unambiguous context free, which means you can get the words in a language in a very uh, unique way, in a nice way. Again, definition doesn't matter. And why do I put them there? Um, it's because every really nice algebraic properties. Okay, so uh, what are the algebraic properties? I need a moment to get there, but uh, well, this is actually kind of the same as the first slide. Now, if you count uh, uh, a language, if you will count words in a language L, that, that's also um, computing a, a growth function, and then you can put the numbers of words of length n in a growth series, so that you get the growth series of a, of a language. And the really uh, nice results here are that regular languages have, uh, so I don't know whom I should cite here, it's sort of folklore, regular languages have rational growth series and then uh, unambiguous context-free languages have algebraic growth series. So I'll call them UCF. And this is a very nice result of Chomsky and Schutzenberger, algebraic. And after that, we don't know anymore. So if you take context-free, you can have, well, rational algebraic or transcendental growth series, so the classification sort of stops there. We have, of course, many results, many papers on particular subclasses, and, uh, but uh, yes, that this is... Um, this is the best uh, characterization that we have. So why did I mention this? Because remember the Riven conjecture. The Riven conjecture says I have a growth series that's transcendental, right? So if I'm counting a language and I get the transcendental uh, growth series, it cannot be uh, a uni u ugh a UCF, an unambiguous context-free language. All right, so just an immediate uh, uh, consequence of the chomsky um theorem. And uh, from now on, if, if, you, um, if you're very courageous, you can stick to UCF, if not just uh, regular is good enough for, for today to understand the languages. All right, so, so just the Riven conjecture tells us in hyperbolic groups, um, uh, conjugacy representatives, this language is not regular, uh, even more it's not UCF. And so what do we have here, right? So then moving on to the asymmetric hyperbolic groups, we have the same result, that the language of uh, conjugacy, or any language of conjugacy representatives, and by that I always mean minimal length, uh, is, is not regular, in fact it's, it is not uh, unambiguous context-free. and. Um, we can do this also for primitive conjugacy classes or for commensurating classes. For lack of time, I'm not going to get into that. It's just a slight modification of the arguments that already work for the standard conjugacy ones. All right, so um, maybe, uh, let's see, um, it is a bit naive to, to try to do a proof. I think proofs work much better at the blackboard than on a slide, but um, I will try um, to give you an idea of, of how uh, this works. So the result for a cylindrically hyperbolic. And, um, well, of course, what we have to use, the only thing we really have is, or, or one of the two things we have, is the result for hyperbolic groups. So there, the language is difficult, it's not regular or not UCF. And then somehow we have to lift that into, um, into a cylindrical hyperbolic group, which contains a hyperbolic group. All right, so we use the hyperbolic group result, um, and then there's the definition. Um, one of the definitions of, of um, insulin hyperbolic groups is that they have um, hyperbolically embedded hyperbolic groups, subgroups, sorry. And so for now, I just call them nicely embedded uh, hyperbolic.
groups. Very important also, and I will, I will, um, I will talk a bit more about it, is that in hyperbolic groups, and even to some extent in asynergy hyperbolic groups, if you take two conjugacy geodesics that are conjugate, you can make them have a bounded conjugator if you permute them a little, if you cyclic permute them. So this is a really key part of the proof. And finally, right, as I said, somehow take the language from hyperbolic groups to, uh, to this bigger one, and don't, don't mess up the complexity don't somehow get it from regular into something much more difficult. So do it very carefully. Um, I have up to 55. Sorry? Really? Oh, 10, okay. Uh, I don't think so, but <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so. <laughs> I think I started 10 past, right? Or 15. So, uh, t well, how do we prove this result about languages? Um, well, there are, so I will, I will um, give the intuition of everything I'm saying, but I thought I should not be vague at least about the, the main results and, and give exactly the statements. So, there's two results that we need to prove this for isolated hyperbolic groups. One is well, not just languages, it's, it's definitely a lot more than that, but it's about manipulating languages carefully. Um, and so, um, it says the following. Um, if you have a uh, group G that's finitely generated that contains the hyperbolic um, subgroup H, which is quasi-isometrically embedded, uh, malnormal, and Morse. So malnormal, I think, is what other people call almost malnormal. Um, so, for today, uh, right, it may, I'm, I mean, not that the intersection is empty, but the intersection is finite. Um, and Morse is like quasi-convexity, right? There you have, you have a, a, a subspace, a subgroup, and you're looking at, at the geodesic connecting points in a subgroup, and that should be, this geodesic should be close to the subgroup here. You relax it a little and you say, um, look at, at um, quasi-geodesic that connects point in a subgroup, and the same should happen. And so assume we have this. And then also assume some more technical condition, which I, so I have condition star, and then condition double star is the following. Oh, I go the other way. So the next condition is, uh, if I have a conjugacy geodesic Q in my group G, and I know that it's conjugate to something in H, so, Conjugate means, right, there is a G on both sides to something in H. Then I can find a cyclic permutation of U. So I just move a prefix to, to, to the back, right? That's a cyclic permutation, such that it is conjugate to something in H with a bounded conjugator. So G is bounded um, uh, by the length of G, so is bounded by this K here. So I, I wrote it in this way instead of length, maybe it's not so good, but so G belongs to the ball of radius K with respect to X. So if you have these two conditions, then any language of conjugacy representatives is not regular or not UCF, if you want. So that's the first result, and this is what I'll attempt to prove, or at least tell you what the ingredients of the proof are. And the second result is more about cylindrically hyperbolic groups. And again, uh, I have one such group with finite generating set X. And um, what I want um, is to have some hyperbolic subgroup. Uh, in this case, it's going to be virtually free, that is hyperbolically embedded um, in G, and this is more or less given to us from, by Tamani uh, Girard del Dos in their memoir. And I also want a second condition which resembles very much what you see there. So if I have a conjugacy geodesic uh, U, then I can find. Um, Right, so it's pretty much what you, I said before, so maybe I won't repeat it. So the point is there exists a K that bounds the conjugators like that. And so what does this mean? It means that acylindrically hyperbolic groups satisfy the condition star and double star from the previous slide. 
For the first one, there was nothing we had to do, and so really the work is to, to prove this kind of bounded conjugacy behavior um, um, and, and show that it works in ACNA hyperbolic groups. And so, uh, right, so with these two results, we get uh, the non-regularity. Now, um, to prove this, it would take more background and time than, than, than I have. So I decided, as I said, to, to look a little, at, a little bit at the first result, which does not require quite as much background. And I think it's, uh, it's very interesting because it, as I said, requires manipulating languages in a very delicate, careful way. Um, and so the first result in a more um, abbreviated form is that I have some group G and I have this subgroup H that's hyperbolic, that's the most important part and then nicely embedded with all these properties. And then uh, I know that there are some bounded, so that, that this behavior holds, right? So when I say bounded conjugators, I mean that this G, um, there is, some k uh, so that this happens. And of course, it's not for any two elements in, in such a group. It's, it's for particular in this case. Um, in, in this case, you have to have u conjugate to something in H, right? That, that, that's what I'm talking about, not about any conjugacy geodesics. And uh, the way I might write this sometimes is I say u is in H, G. So that means, right? Uh, any um, u is conjugate to something in H. And of course, this is an abuse of notation. You shouldn't write such a thing. It's a word, but think of the element that it represents, right? So that, that's what I mean. Okay, so uh, what do we do here? So how do we prove this? Uh, well, first of all, um, we'll, we'll put the, the conjugacy, the, sorry, the torsion aside. There's only uh, finitely many such classes, so uh, they never uh, change the complexity of a language of finite sets, or in any case, not in the Chomsky hierarchy. So don't worry about them. We, we dealt with them for today. Just assume we have a torsion-free group. And the idea is, right, so I said we have U conjugate to something in H, but what happens in H, I didn't tell you anything about that. So, well, what happens is that we can find the generating set Y um, and, and the conjugacy geodesic V over Y. So V represents an element in H. Okay, so let me write here. So I can find this is V, which is again, so conjugacy geodesic, I said, is as short as possible with respect to, uh, to conjugacy. So this is over y, such that um, well, the length of the conjugator is, is uh, bounded, and, um, and they fellow travel. So what does it mean to fellow travel? I think if, if in any book on, on hyperbolic groups, you, you see that very quickly. The definition is you have two paths, and, and somebody's walking here, somebody here at the same speed, and this is bounded by some constant. Uh, uniform constant. So, of course, what I told you here is the, the intuition. Uh, it's it's uh, a bit far from the precise uh, thing that we have, but this is very this this um, fellow traveling is is important. And let's just say that whenever so now I have U and V bounded conjugator fellow traveling. And so I call such pairs a BCD for bounded conjugacy diagram. I'll show you in the next slide. And well, so the thing that made things difficult was that this fellow traveler property is non-standard in a few ways. The most important one being that this is over X and this is over Y. So we have different alphabets. And the other problem is that when you look a priori at such a thing, the fellow traveling is not synchron uh, synchronous. So synchronous means you walk at the same speed. Asynchronous means one is faster than the other. And if you have asynchronous behavior, all, all, every, all results about languages sort of get out of the door. So we had to really force things to make synchronous and, and uh, use lots of tricks. And so I'm not going to get into um, those kind of details, um, but as I said, one of the really important uh, uh, pieces of, of this proof is that hyperbolic groups are really nice with respect to conjugacy and um, 
They have what we call uh, bounded conjugacy diagrams. You'll see a picture in just a moment, but the idea is if you have U that's short with respect to conjugacy, maybe not conjugacy geodesic, but just cyclically reduced in some sense, and V, um, either they're very short, so we don't need to worry about them, or they're long, and then we can cyclically permute them a bit and get a short conjugator. Okay, so this guy is short. And so um, this was uh, appeared for the first time in the Bryce and Heflicker book, and they showed the hyperbolic groups have this property. And it's very interesting to, to find out which other groups have this property. Um, and, and of course, we're, hyper, we're talking about hyperbolic groups, so this works for any generating set. And one can show them maybe for rags with respect to the standard generating set it holds, or for other groups, for some generating set, but I don't know any other class of groups where it works for all generating sets. So it's sort of a very nice behavior, and that's the picture. You have two words, U and V, and maybe the conjugator C is rather long, but if you, if you take half, right, the, 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 the left half of the picture and move it to the other side, that's the same as taking a cyclic permutation of U and V, right? And, and then you see how I, this, the, of course, they're still conjugate, but now the conjugator is much shorter and actually can be uniformly bounded. So that's really one of the most important things uh, that we use. Um, so we have these, uh, um, these pairs of words, and now, yeah, it's, it will start to get a bit painful, so you can also check your email if you want. But uh, uh, the formal setup, so you, if you want to do it correctly is, well, since I have two different generating sets, X and Y, uh, how do I work carefully with them? And I introduce a, a, a set Z, which is the generating set for G, and then, I think of X um, and Y, right, these sets that you've seen before as just, I, I map them into G, they represent the element of G, and I have this, um, I also need uh, an additional symbol dollar which maps to the identity. So what I, when I talk now about these pairs that fellow traveler are conjugates, the really correct definition is this, that, um, um, that they are words over, oh sorry, and I didn't say, so B is now this alphabet. So it's X together with the dollar symbol um, and Cartesian product Y uh, together with the dollar symbol. And so now I work over the alphabet B. And why do I do that? Because I want any, any pair, right? So I have a UV in B star. And the point is when you take it like that, I know that U is equal to V with respect to, uh, well, sorry, with res I mean, yeah, as, as words in whatever, this is respect to um, X union dollar and so on. And, and so I need this to get the, the synchronous fellow travel property for later. No, it's just uh, Z is G is generated by Z, put it aside, put it aside, yes. And then I have, I know, um, I have, so, so of course, when this is a definition. In the proofs, it turns out that um, Z is equal to X, I think, almost every time. But just to give a correct definition and to have some flexibility, it's not always the same, yeah. So this is what I really want, and why do I want this? Sort of strange uh, pair condition, because we have uh, a few results about languages where we look at, um, at pairs of words. And so, yeah, this is just to give you a flavor. I, I don't want to say much at all about them, but if you have such words, such pairs U and V, with this property, then the language M of these pairs is regular. So this is some result like that. Um, again, if you have, so, so I know that I have these pairs that are regular. Maybe for some U, I have lots of V that are, are its pair or its partner. Um, so, so doing that kind of thing is not enough to just look at a pair. You need to take uh, a map that associates to every U of V. And so, again, what kind of operations can you do? You can, uh, if you have a pair of words like this, um, deciding which one is shorter in this sense, it's also regular operation. 
and even more than that, having pairs where V is the smallest possible with these properties regular. So there's all kinds of operations that you can do, and, uh, and you keep the regularity. You don't, don't uh, change the complexity of the language. So, from, so now let's say we have a language L of conjugacy representatives for the big group. Um, I'm only going to look at, um, at those elements, so I'm here, if I find the point, right. So L is the language for the big group G, I intersect it. I'm only looking at those elements that are conjugate to something in H. I take this map that associates uh, conjugate V, that as short as possible. And with all this manipulation of languages, I get that the language, if, if the language I started was were regular or UCF, then this language in, in uh, H is regular or UCF, and that would give me a contradiction, right? Because the language in the hyperbolic group should be bad, should not be regular. So, so if I assume that something is nice in the big group, um, I get something nice in the subgroup that's hyperbolic, but the Riving conjecture says that cannot happen. And well, I haven't, right, so to completely finish is, uh, I talked a little bit about conjugacy, but it looked like it's, um, it's uh, conjugacy in G. Because of malnormality, you have this property, so you can reduce it to conjugacy in H. And, um, and so it's a bit of what I said already, that R is the language of conjugacy representatives in the hyperbolic group H. So is R is the, 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 the language I built in the way I showed you, associating to you its pair that fellow travels and so on. So, so that's pretty much what I said, and, and I'll finish here. Yes, uh, well, I can just say, um, or if you want, I can show. So, um, hyperbolic, uh, quasi-isometrically embedded, malnormal, which people, I would say, mal almost malnormal, and Morse, which is like quasi-convexity. Yeah. So, just a little comment. Uh, so, you mentioned that uh, this result about bounded uh, conjugacy? Yeah is uh, in the book of uh, Brighton and uh, Hefliger. Yes. I, I think it's much before, I, at, least, uh, at least in the original paper by Gromov. Uh, it's possible this is but where... But, but um, I yeah, mean, yeah. Uh, there was a detailed proof also uh, much before. Yeah, possible, yeah. I just wanted to make you a run. So, rational algebraic, and then you jump to transcendental. In Flagellet's book, there's a lot about definite and yeah, dealgebraic. Yeah, yeah. So, definite, you can't have infinitely many poles. But my question is for hyperbolic groups, are they all not definite rather than just. Uh, that's a good question. We, we didn't look at that. Yeah, we didn't get into. Uh, I mean,. One should look at the results on asymptotics. We have nothing more than that. So you're allowed to have the one on n in the denominator for d Exactly. So that's the only thing you can use for a general hyperbolic group. For the free group, of course, we have the formula, so you can say more if you want. But general hyperbolic group. Yeah, I mean, I didn't go into, yeah. There's, as I said, there's many other kinds of functions, but... Uh, Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you'll find out what those groups are in in half an hour. Yeah. yeah.